Hey, hey, this is Tiger again. Welcome to my stream. Hey, hey, this is Tiger again. Welcome to my stream. And we have the echo back on the stream, but now it is off. Hello, AJ. Thank you for moderating my stream once more. After this little break that we had due to other things that came up and needed taken care of. Tonight I want to take you to the Taranta Rampe DLC because we want to run the Baureihe 612, the Verbrennungstriebwagen 612 and have a look at the tilting technology that runs on this train and alongside with this the train control system that is only there and it is supposed to um, control the trains that are mm. running with this tilting technology mm. so the Tarant Rampe DLC mm. which service did I prepare it was this one mm. the 1101 we will be running a double unit um, AMU so double traction mm. two trains of the same kind <coughs> and we are going this one Regional Express 3, 3445-3787 from Nuremberg Main Station mm. to Dresden Main Station mm. and we will be doing this probably in mm. January so that we can have a bit of snow what goes along well. Yeah, we will have snow today because we are in winter, it goes along with the season. So first we go into the service and um, mm. just have a look at the train and then I will restart it so that we are not late. But I want to invest some minutes to have a proper look at the train and what is actually running technology wise and train control wise on this train. Because all that stuff that we are talking about is unique to this DLC so far. And it is not around, or it has not, uh, uh, has not been around for so long. This train is the loading screen. In the loading screen, because it's looking awesome, I think it was, if I saw it correctly and remember it correctly, I think it was a Baureihe 182 in the uh, MRCE livery. That's the thing that we, and, and it was, uh, it was actually coupled to uh, a British class 30, uh, British class 66, if I saw that correctly. So two more or less freight train locomotives coupled together, mm. what you usually would not encounter in any timetable mode in the game. <coughs> we used this locomotive that was in, in at the front in a, with a different livery or with that livery, I don't remember in the PCBU stream when we were doing the dive. Don't know if you remember. Well, this is the cab, the cockpit of our Baureihe 612. It is a train that does not run on electricity. You can see it does not have a pantograph. It is a diesel powered uh, multi unit. So we <coughs> have this train especially so that we can run on on tracks that are not electrified and uh, there obviously we cannot rely on electricity that we get from above. Here we have it, but this train obviously can go on tracks that does not have the elect electrification so it generates its own electricity <coughs> with its diesel engines. and. Yeah, what is what is the special feat about this train? It is not only the first um, diesel uh, multiple unit uh, in the game in Transim World, but it is also the first one that has this tilting deck technology. So, what is the benefit of a tilting deck technology? Well, it enables the train to tilt in curves, and why is that good? because then the train can run faster through the curves. You have a limitation of the so-called lateral acceleration that passengers can sustain when they are uh, riding on a train and I think it is usually about one meter per square second uh, lateral acceleration that it is uh, admissible 
<coughs> and you cannot go beyond that and if you're going faster through a curve then the lateral acceleration will go beyond this threshold and this is nothing that is allowed to happen on passenger trains so if the train actually is able to tilt to the inside of the curve then this lateral acceleration that the passengers have to sustain is lower and this is why the train can go faster than a train that does not have this tilting technology <coughs> the tilting technology you can see that on our uh, MFA on our display unit those three blue buttons are for the tilting technology and for the GNT train control technology that comes with the tilting technology um, the tilting technology itself is not the GNT but the GST it is called with a, a very beautiful German word the Gleisbogen Abhängige Wagenkastensteuerung, which translates more or less to um <coughs> the the curve radius adapting coach control. Uh, we will get to the G and T, but first the G S T, so that we um, can uh, can can tell the two things apart from each other. The G S T is the technology that enables our train to tilt. So if I put in the reverser, I think this should be enough. And then I switch on the technology here, and this is the lever that, or the switch that switches this tilting technology on. Then our train should probably go into um, a test mode for this tilting. So I switch it on, and can we see it tilt already? If we look at front at front of it, mm. can you see it tilt? Yes, it's actually tilting. It's leaning from the left to the right. It is, well, obviously quite slow, but if you compare it with the structures behind it, you can see that it is tilting. So this is the technology that enables the train to tilt in curves, and this allows us to go through the <coughs> curves faster than a train without this uh, tilting technology can do. So and you can also see that the indicator for the GST is on as soon as we are switched it on. What is not on is the G and T. And the G and T stands for Geschwindigkeitsüberwachung für Neitech Züge. That is the special train control for trains that have this tilting technology and um, why do we need a special train control for that because if we go faster than trains are usually allowed to go then we cannot rely uh, we cannot rely on the speeds that are signaled on the speed boards that we have on the track side all the lf6 and lf7 signs that we have on the roadside usually they do not necessarily apply because we can go faster than that in our train so there must be something that tells us that's the first thing, how fast we can go. And we will see that this is in real life um, shown on the Abula uh, screen, the electronic timetable machine <coughs> that there is in trains in real life and that we do not have in the game. We only have the screen and we have a, a dummy screen for the Abula. And we will see that they generated a, a very reduced dummy display for the GNT where they tell us what is the speed that we are allowed to go at the moment and what will be the next one at the moment it tells us GNT out which, which means GNT off obviously so we are at the moment not receiving GNT data how do we turn it on the GNT the surveillance for that yeah well I was just uh, saying th the GNT is telling us at the first time in the Ebula system and in our printed out Buchfahrplan, in our printed timetable, um, how fast we can go. And uh, the GNT system controls us. And how it is doing that, we will have a presentation for that later as soon as we are getting to our first stop. Um, but first, how do we turn that stuff on? We have to actually get off, uh, get, get up. and. Uh, leave our cap 
A lot of passengers are actually on the train already. This is the first class compartment that we have to go through and open this cabinet. And there are a lot of switches and a lot of, well, the battery power, for example, it is usually on if you start a service already. And there are some switches <coughs> and there are some indicators and what you need to turn on are those three uh, switches. There is a switch for the CIFA, there is a switch for the PZB. What is important to know that the PZB runs according uh, or alongside the GNT, so those two systems are running at the same time. That is important to know. So GNT does not replace the PSB, but it uh, yeah works alongside with it. And then the GNT. So those are the three. Um, train control systems, security, safety systems that need to be turned on in this cabinet so that they can actually run on the train. Yeah, close it. And now we can go back to our train for setting up this train and yeah, now you can see probably that the GNT light is on. No, it's not on yet. It probably built is on as soon as you put the reverser into forward and then you can see that the GNT is on and this just like the B indicator on LZB trains is indicating that the train is listening to GNT signals that are coming from balises from the from the track we will see them on the track when we pass them later and we will talk about it in the presentation that I prepared that is the first thing that you can see here. And the CIFA obviously runs according to it, and we have the PZB indi indicators here. So this train can obviously only run in PZB O. This is why it only has the 70 and the 85 indicators, so that it can do the Wechsel blinken, the alternate uh, flashing for the restricted monitoring. If you want to know no more about PZB and all that stuff, I won't go into details today because we have, I think, at the moment seven streams uh, videos that cover PZB and the peculiarities of PZB, so I can't ask you to watch them. If you set up this train, never forget it has a brake key that needs to be inserted first and then switched to on. And um, yeah, then you can open the doors. To open the doors, you have the selector for which side you want to open, and then the open, frei is open, and true is close. Actually, the headlights are usually set to tail lights, so you need to set them to headlights so that they are not red anymore. And then you can switch the headlights with the appropriate this is for the cab lights here and the headlights which is desk lights where is the headlights which this is the center well here next to this switch that is actually quite nice so if you want to run with bright lights with high beams then you can do that over there you can see the pzb apparatus the override and the acknowledged yeah, from inside to outside, so this is the Wachsamkeitstaste, the Acknowledge, this is the Freitaste, the Release-Taste, and this is the Befehl 40, Override, Befehlstaste. That's what it says. Yeah. If you start this train, um, you have to be aware that the brakes are actually applied when you start the train, so at the moment, even when locking the doors, you cannot uh, apply power because, or not properly, because the brakes are still applied. One thing that annoyed me a lot when I was trying to uh, operate this train, if you don't use the, uh, the keyboard shortcuts for opening and closing the doors, but really use this, this, uh, this thing here, the selector, and you switch it to left to open the doors with this button, and then you decide to close it with this button again. You wait for the doors to get closed. Yep, and then you release the brakes. You can hear the brake cylinders clear. This is the pressure for the brake cylinders with the red hand, as you can see. And uh, reverse it to forward, and then this is the power and brake lever. You would put it to forward. Yeah, and then it should just 
count towards 100% from one, and it doesn't. The train starts rolling, but the power does not increase beyond the 100%. So what is the problem with that? The problem is that there is a peculiarity within the within the system that closes the doors, because the doors are closed now, but for some reason the train wants you to put this switch to lock all and then press the two button. Release the brakes and then you should actually be able to accelerate the train beyond 1%. So if that happens to you, if you're using the modeled door control, then you can run into this problem here. Okay. As I said, I will just restart the service so that we are not so super late. It is an ambitious timetable here, so you really have to to not tarry and not tr uh, try not to waste a lot of time. Before we set up the train again and run this time, actually. So that's what's wrong there. Yeah, you remember when I, w I was uh, when I was going crazy why it did not work out right, and it was this problem because obviously if you open the doors with your sh keyboard shortcut, press the Y button or whatever it is in, in your uh, in your localization and the doors open, and then you press the close button in the modeled way, then it does not work. If you actually use the Y button again to close it, then it, then it works properly, but if you uh, use the modeled close button then uh, it does not work because it wants to lock the doors not only close them that is a thing that is not really modeled in the game uh, 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 thoroughly that there is actually a difference between closing the doors and locking them right unlocking them and opening them so in real life drivers uh, when they stop at the station they don't necessarily um, they don't open all the doors on the train necessary, but they unlock them so, so that passengers can open the doors that they actually want to use if they want to get off the train or on the train. And as long as the doors are unlocked and passengers can open and close them. And before starting to drive, I don't not, do not only need to close them, but I also have to lock them, obviously, so that they cannot be opened again by the passengers. And this distinction between opening uh, closing, locking and unlocking is not, not always so uh, apparent in the game because passengers are not opening or closing doors. They just pass through them sometimes even if they are closed. And uh, all what we can do to simulate this a bit is opening and closing them. And I think this distinction is what is causing the problems here. Before actually starting it, I wanted to show you how this thing with the ebula works and this is um, a simulated ebula that I built um, together with Open Minded who provided the timetables for it and, and the data and it is obviously only a simulation of the ebula display but it is somehow close to what it would look like on a, on a real train and what you can do here is to in our excel file that you can download if you want from our uh, uh, from my discord server uh, what you can do is actually first select your service and first we have to select the train that we have and it's the baureihe 612 what i did not tell you it's a train that is built by bombardier as are most of the modern multiple unit trains that are there in, in Europe and it is uh, most of the trains have a, a, a nickname right and the Bombardier calls this train a Regio Swinger what um, well I leave that to your imagination why this name did not really stick uh, <laughs> it's maybe it's a bit an unfortunate name but this is what Bombardier calls it and it is a 
Verbrennungstriebwagen 612 in German. And they are still around a lot on, on lines that are not electrified. You can switch then the, the, the Zugart, the service category, and we are on a regional express 3. We are going from Chemnitz to Dresden, that is eastbound. And then you can select your Zugnummer, and our Zugnummer is, if I see that correctly, it was... What was it again? Can't see it because it's blocking out. It's three four four five. Three four four five. Let's bring the thing up again. The three four four five service. Live one. And then you can already see what you're doing. This is your train number. This is um, where you're going from Chemnitz to Dresden. We have. Um, train 612 Bauchreihe with double traction, so two trains, we are starting at 11.02, so service starts at 11.01 in the game and then 11.02 we are supposed to depart. It is a 612, our top speed is 160 on a GNT train, this is our weight AJ already, 209.7 tons, 107 meters, our brakes are we have a uh, brake percentage of 194, we have RE and uh, magnetic track brakes and are running in PZBO obviously. So, not to fix it. And then we load it. And then we get this display and this is what an Ebula display um, looks like. Um, uh, or it is a bit similar to what an Ebula uh, display look like. And to read an Ebula display, what you need to know is that you read it from the bottom to the top and it will scroll that way. This diamond here, this white diamond, is indicating where your train is at the moment and it will move to the top and after it has traveled about one third of the page, it switches and then it goes on until it reaches the destination. This is the night mode, actually our tool can switch between night mode that we have here and day mode that we have here. So I connected the macros that do that with the buttons uh, here on, on the train. And this uh, system tells you in um, accordance to where you are, so this is the this is the, the the kilometer mark kilometer mark where you are at the moment where you are stationed this is the name of where you are we are at Chemnitz Hauptbahnhof at the moment and they tell you what is the track speed for that part of track that you are on like here we are in an 80 track speed and then we will get into a 100 110 and so on and the interesting thing is that this Ebula system can Distinguish between GNT and not GNT. At the moment it is showing us GNT because that is what our train is supposed to run under. And you have this GNT button here and if you click it you can toggle between GNT profiles and non-GNT profiles. And if you look at this column here with all the speeds that we have, if I toggle the GNT on or off, it will actually make a difference. So this is GNT on. You can see we are going from 100 to 110, 130, 140 and without it we would be 100 much longer than 110, 120 and so on. So I do it again. Toggle. So the Abula system knows all the different limits and they can it can show you on, on the train. So what our tool can do, we can actually brow, uh, yeah, we can scroll through the whole thingy and without the train moving and you can look what is up ahead you can see that we are running through a tunnel here in in this part of the screen you can see where there is a lot of of, of a steep gradient if you have these jagged lines it means this is a part where there is a gradient and if you have two of them then it is a steep gradient and then at the end you will end up here at Dresden Hauptbahnhof. And it also tells you where the GNT ends and where it begins. This is where the GNT ends and at the start of our little service here, this is where the GNT part starts. The problem that we have with our tool is 
we can have it running. If you start the clock actually you can see that the time is running here in the top right corner and the diamond will move along the line. The problem that we definitely have with this tool is that we cannot really link it to the game. Um, I stop it again to show you how this thing here works. If you look at the appropriate data, so all the data are is in uh, different sheets in this Excel file here, this would be the appropriate file plan with its data. So this is the sheet that I provided and open-minded he filled in all the data and you can see that we have like stop patterns for the train. How long it takes the train to get from the start here at the bottom to finish with different stop patterns. So this stop pattern 1 is for the Regionalbahn 30. It has much more stops and the Regional Express 3 has only a few stops and this is a special service that has different stop patterns. So this is provided in those sheets and the problem is we don't actually know those times here. We can only guess them. What we know in the game is when the train is supposed to arrive at a specific station and we can figure out how long it is supposed to stay there and when it is supposed to depart again. Well, what we cannot really know is at what time stamp the train is supposed to arrive at a specific waypoint in between. So this is something that open-minded try to work out with an educated guess and with some calculations about how much acceleration is possible and deceleration and so on. Uh, but obviously we cannot know that. So this is only guesswork. And then we move our diamond in the Ebola system here along with this um, with this calculated uh, timeline where the train is supposed to be at a specific uh, point in time. So the time runs and according to the time we are moving the diamond. Obviously we do not know if the train is really there or if the player is faster or slower than that. Um, so we need to be able to adjust that by the player because we are not getting it out of the game. There is no API or any other uh, interface where we can actually get it out of the game. Unfortunately, and Dovetail Games already told us that they are not planning on providing stuff like this. So this is why our simulated Ebula system does not really rock at the moment because the player has always to um, adjust that and he can do that. He can move the diamond up and down, you can see that. and. The player can tell the train to wait a couple of times. And you can see on the bottom here that um, the system is telling you that you are delayed. Uh, always compared to the timeline that we try to figure out and to, to guess. Yeah. So if there is plus 1.2 minutes, that it means we are 1 minute and 20 seconds late. So the Ebula system does not show you the seconds in exact seconds but it also it always rounds it to tenths of seconds. This is why you always have the point 0.1, point 0.2 up to point 0.5 and more you won't see because then the new minute starts. Same with the kilometers here. So this is one problem and then the other problem obviously is that the time in the game is relative to the actual time that the player is living in. So the game time can run faster or it can run slower and uh, so the player also has to adjust the time that is running in the tool to the time that is running in the game. We have buttons here that can add 10 seconds or subtract 10 seconds to the time in the tool but this you can see makes it cumbersome for the player to do always adjusting where the train is and then adjusting what time it is in the game. We also have a possibility to incorporate a so-called time warp factor where you can specify if the try if the time is supposed to run faster or slower in the tool to try to adapt it 
to um, the game but um, it does not always work out because sometimes the time in the the game runs almost according to normal time then sometimes it is delayed longer I think it depends on how much data the tra the, the game has to load into and uh, so <sighs> I have been experimenting with a system that generates a time warp factor profile for the whole DLC but well maybe we will finish that uh, sometime else the problem is really we don't get an api if we if, if if we got out of the game like this is the actual time in the game we would be a big step far uh, further if we got this is actually the point where the train is supposed to be and this is the point where the train actually is then we could simulate uh, simulate with a tool like this um a gps uh driven ebula system that is uh, what what a real life train do yeah they always know from gps where the train is and then they can show the driver by positioning the diamond in in what section of the track he is yeah this is a little um thing about telling about our ebula simulating tool and i know that dovetail games are uh, supposedly working on an Ebula system that runs in the game um, but I don't know when it will actually come maybe with the next German route already but I kind of doubt it so what can you do if you don't want to use this cumbersome Ebula tool that looks sweet but is cumbersome in my opinion you can go with a Buchfahrplan. plan. So this is actually the old version before this electronic device worked. <coughs> the driver would be handed out a printed far plan with all the relevant data. The format is a bit different, but um, in this is actually not in the published version of our Ebula tool yet, I think. This is a separate uh, file that we published before here this is my experiment my experiment of creating the Buchfahrplan plan automatically from the data that uh, open-minded provided for the abula system so it works quite nice you get a sheet of paper that you can put underneath your clip that you have in your cap and then you know where you are and you can see that there are two columns for the speeds the 2A and the 2B column and the 2A is the normal speed and the 2B it is the uh, tilting technology speed so you can see the same thing again now you have to read it from top to bottom the Buchfarblon unlike the Ebula where you read it from the bottom to the top but you also have those jagged lines for the uh, uh, gradients where you have it and you have the kilometer marks and where you actually are and, and the speed profile and your times when you are supposed to arrive somewhere and depart somewhere if there is only one time then this is where you have to pass and if there are two times this is where you have to um, arrive and then depart again yeah so much for that this is where the driver gets the information how fast he can go if the tilting technology is active so i end this little addendum and actually go back to train driving are you still with me aj or was that too boring or too much advertisement about our our stuff yeah this is what usually runs here in this on this screen so reverse in unlock the brakes open the doors adjust the headlights if you turn on the tilting technology when the doors are open the train does not do the tilting self tests because obviously passengers don't want to be tilted when they are just boarding the train so it just doesn't do it then 
turn on the safety systems in the cabinet, sit down again, close the doors. You can see if you use the keyboard controls it puts it to lock all automatically so with keyboard controls this is not a problem and then reverse it to forward and then they can accelerate. Yeah. Did I not release my brakes? Releasing the brakes would be a great thing to do as well. Then accelerating works much better. We are in the PZBO start program limited to 40 indicated by the alternative alternately flashing indicators since we have to pass this repeater for the 80 here that I am supposed to acknowledge according to operating rules I wait with the release from the start program until I have passed it so that I don't get a Zwangsbremsung on the 1000 Hz. This was the definite white 80, so at the moment we are restricted to 80 with our train. And GNT is still off. We will have to pass the first transponder that gives us the GNT data. The combined brake and throttle handle in this train is a bit special and it needs, here is the 10, so we can actually go 100 as soon as our train has passed the speed changing point, still no GNT, so the signage is actually valid for us. And now before I explain the combined throttle and brake handle, I want you to see where the Euro Bali is here, this one. And now you can see the U GNT light indicator came on indicating that we are now in GNT control territory and at the same time this thing here, this rudimentary Ebula system is telling us at the moment 110, later 130. Back to how this combined throttle and brake thingy works. If you want to increase throttle or brake, you have to move the lever into the appropriate direction, but then it does not apply throttle according to how far ahead or back you set your lever, but if you put it to the front, it will accelerate the acceleration so the percentage will rise if you take it back the ex the percentage will drop so you have to hold it to the front or to the back if you want to increase or decrease or actually to increase throttle or increase brake power and if you want to reduce either one you have to either move the lever into the opposite direction and wait for it to count down. Now we passed the sign showing as 11, meaning 110 under normal circumstances, but in the GNT we can go to 130 here. Yeah, back to the the handle. If you want to lose your throttle faster than just moving it to the opposite direction and wait for it to count down like I want it here now you can just when it is counting down move it into that direction once more for a short bit and then it will be on zero right away so now I'm using the brake function because we are running downhill and as a holding brake it actually works well. If you actually want to slow down the train or actually stop it at the station then I would strongly re recommend not to use the combined brake handle 
but the brake handle on the right hand. So not only this combined handle here, but the one on the right. Because the combined brake handle is a bit slow if you want to apply brakes and does not really get the train to a stop. And on the right side, if you use the brake handle for the right side, it will blend in the electric brake nonetheless. But for slowing down a couple of kilometers per hour, it works fine with the combined brake handle. So, what did our train tell us now? That there is a reduction in speed limit in coming to 120. You can see the red indicator flashing here. It lit up steadily and is now flashing. That is announcing to us that there is a reduction in speed limit up ahead. And at the same time, we are slowing down for the station. So, I'm using the actual brake lever on the right side and to not get confused I set the combined brake and um, throttle to zero I bring the train to a speed of about 40 to run alongside the platform and then slow it down even more. Yeah, I ran a bit far because I did too much explaining. You can see that on this DLC this yellow circle moves quite fast so that you can make up time that you lost quite nicely and before we can go on with our train I will show you the presentation about the GNT that I prepared again the GNT is the control system that controls the speed profile that is uh, only applicable for trains with this tilting technology and we will see that we will see a lot of similarities between this system and the Axis system that we talked about on the Harlem line and uh, on the Boston Sprinter uh, video. What is not surprising because both systems were built by Siemens, so it is more or less out of the same kitchen. But with all the differences, some ruling principles are the same. So what do we have? We have our track and on the track we usually have the signage and the speeds that are allowed to uh, to go on, on the track and the LF7 boards telling you for example here you can go 70 from here on you can go 120 then you get warned that there will be a reduction to 90 then you get the sign that tells you from here on 90 that is the normal speed profile for non-tilting trains and then we have the tilting trains and how do the tilting trains get their information they get it from a transponder in the track and this is those valise that I put there and just like the transponders in the access system they send a bunch of data to the train and the train is picking it up and the transponder tells the train about the incoming uh, speed profile for the next about five kilometers and uh, or if there are more changes in within that uh, track section than less than five kilometers but this is about what you get so the train gets information about what the civil speed limits will be for especially for the tilting trains because they are higher than the signal speed so if you look into your timetable in your ebula system or in your printed out book far plan you will see that starting from here where the entry point for the gnt is you can go 80 instead of 70 and maybe at the next speed changing point you can go 140 with your tilting train even if the sign tells you 112 and here where you have to reduce your speed to 90 it tells you you have to reduce your speed even to 100 and you can obviously see the benefit of this you can run your train faster you can run more trains 
within the same time frame you can transport more passengers more traffic make more money everything gets more effective if the train can run faster the downside is obviously that it costs a lot of money to actually build this technology into the tracks i've read a figure of i think 100,000 euros for one kilometer just to build and maintain this technology and uh, you can imagine that this is a lot of money if you have smaller lines that run for quite some some distance <coughs> and uh, yeah the sad s the sad story about this this tilting technology is that it is not compatible with the etcs system and as far as you can read on the internet it is considered a dying technology by the deutsche bahn and they are not investing anymore it is still around there are still the 612 trains that are running on those tracks and it is still in use but um I think they plan on retiring those units in about, well, around 2030 and they won't invest in this technology anymore because they consider it a dying technology. Interestingly enough, in Bavaria, in the south of Germany, you can read a press release from um, a company that is that is in charge of all the tracks in, uh, for, th for the for the regional trains in Bavaria, they actually plan on investing in this tilting technology. The press release was from 2019. I don't know if they still plan on doing this, but um, maybe they invest more. Obviously, they have to take care of more rural, rural regional lines with less electrification, with a lot of bends in the more uh, a hilly and mountainous terrain in the southern, in, in the south of Germany, south of Bavaria especially. So it might be more effective there. So you can read that they actually wanted to buy a new tilting trains beyond the two beyond or uh, after past 2030. Actually, uh, we will see if they do that and if if they find actually tilting trains uh, then to to buy them so if they find a manufacturer that will build them because well the problem is really that the technology is not compatible with the ETCS and uh, this is where everything is supposed to go so that we have more or less a unified train control system in Europe so that trains can run from one country to the other without having to be able to run um, a bunch of different train control systems we we actually used to have ICE trains with uh, tilting technology, the 411 I think and the 412 if I'm not mistaken, and uh, yeah, but they are retired as far as I know. I don't know if they run somewhere still. I've never seen one in real life to be honest. Um, but that was there, and uh, most of it, most of the technology is vintage though. So, uh, back to our presentation. I am digressing a lot today because this is actually an interesting topic. The tilting technology and, uh, and, and uh, the control system for it. If we translate what we see here in our timetable and on the track into a speed profile, starting with zero at the bottom, we can see at the beginning we have to stick to 70, then we can accelerate to 80 when we past uh, the Balis and get into GNT territory then we can accelerate to 140 and then we have to slow down to 100 again so what we will be shown on the pause screen on our game will look somewhat like this yeah obviously this is not what the train can do and is allowed to do so the green line on our pause screen should look somewhat like this we have to remain below the 70. As soon as we pass the Balis are in GNT uh, territory, we can accelerate to the 80. And then when we get to the point where the speed switches to 140, we cannot accelerate at once. You all know that. 
we have to wait for our train to pass the speed changing point so the length of train we will have to stay below be, be below the 80 and then we can start accelerating to the 140 stay there and then we have to decelerate so that we can uh, hit the new speed with the slower speed of um, 100 so this green curve is what we will be aiming for and um, what does the GNT control us to then? We will be controlled to a speed that looks like this. As long as we have a constant speed limit, it will control us to this constant speed limit. And there will be actually three steps of intervention for the system. One at three kilometers per hour above the control speed, six kilometers per hour above the control speed and ten kilometers per per hour above the control speed and you can see that the system is clever enough that it knows how long the train is and that it controls us to the old speed limit for the whole distance that the train needs to travel until the end of the train has passed the speed changing point and we will be controlled to this so <coughs> Uh, we have seen this in the axis system as well. It is supposed to do that in the axis system as well. And, uh, and the GNT system definitely does it. And then all of a sudden it controls us to the new um, speed. So when we are actually have an increase in the speed limit, uh, we will just jump up to it. Uh, with a decrease in the speed limit is a totally different story because then our uh, control system calculates brake curves as you can see here it calculates that we have to slow down gradually and have to approach the speed changing point gradually and have to slow down we cannot just drive on with 140 and then within the last split second uh, decelerate to the 100. We have seen this in the KVB system, we have seen this in the Axis system. Brake curves calculated by a computer on the train and we will be controlled to this calculated um, control speed. So the three steps of intervention decrease alongside. You can get a penalty break up from this system before you actually pass the speed changing point. We have seen this in the KVB, in the axis, and this is where we have the similarities. So you can see the similarities between the GNT control and the axis system. We are getting our data from one bodies. We are not getting in from a cable like in the LZB where we are getting it constantly and all the time, but we're getting it at a certain point and then again at the next point at the next bullies and it tells us what the speed limit is to the next thing so this 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 um, getting information at the transponder at one single point is what we have as a sim similarity with the access system and then obviously it controls the track speed the civil speed not the signal speed but the but but the track speed and thus 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 we can ignore the signage that we have on the track side signs what we cannot ignore, even when we are um, running under GNT, are the signals. So if there are signals that tell us to go slower than the speed that is signaled in the timetable, we obviously have to comply with the signals. This is why they are shown to us. Um, and then we also have to do all the PZB stuff that we know. So if we get a signaled uh, reduction in speed limit, by a flashing green together with a yellow 8 or a yellow 6 for example. We have to acknowledge that we will get a thousand hertz monitoring and we have to comply with all the stuff that comes from the PCB. If there is a PCB magnet at um, a sign like this, a trackside sign, a fixed sign that um, announces a speed reduction, we don't have to acknowledge it. We don't need to do that because we can ignore the signs. And there is actually a system that uh, suppresses everything that comes from the PZB when we are running under GNT and the tilting technology is active. Yeah, so don't forget, we have to acknowledge signals, we have to heed signals, we have to comply with signals, but we do n with color light signals that can switch, but we do not need to comply with the signs, with the speed signs, with the LF6 and the LF7 signs. All the rest we have to comply with. And you can see how we get controlled at an increase length of train will still be there and 
before we get to a decrease we will have the braking curves here it will actually get us down to the new speed limit a bit before the speed changing point because there is a distance tolerance as a margin of error in it uh, in case that uh, the system has an error in its calculation so that it is made sure that we are down to the new speed before we hit the speed changing point what we will what we will see on our uh, on our dashboard is this we already had a look at it when we are were setting up the train um, this button tells us that the technology is working and switched on so the Leisbogenabhängige Wagenkastensteuerung is on so that the train can actually tilt the tilting tech is on and the GNT button tells us that the surveillance the train control system is on and running um, and then as soon as we hit the Balise and are actually in the GNT territory it also lights up the button with the U what we also know from the uh, LZB the U means we are now actually getting data from the surveillance system from the train control train control system and then those three buttons are on until we get to the point where the GNT territory ends then this button will go dark again the others two will stay on and unless there is uh, an error in the system those will not flash the red G GND button that we already saw uh, when we were slowing down our train will light up to warn us about an incoming reduction in track speed limit. It will light up steadily first and it will sound an alarm for about one second. This dirt, the schnarre, it is called, will tell us there is an incoming speed reduction and then you can slow down and you can start braking and after about 200 meters this button will be flashing and telling you now you are in the part where the brake curves are applicable where you actually have to slow down to not get into problems with the surveillance system and the tr train control system and as soon as you hit the speed changing point then this indicator will go dark again so don't confuse this with the S GNT button that we see on the next slide the G GNT button is actually something that tells you uh, and warns you as a driver and helps you to comply with the GNT speed profile what is in so far more convenient for the driver than in the access system what has a very very short distance only before the speed changing point to warn you you cannot rely on that on an access controlled train uh, on an gnt controlled train you actually can wait until the button lights up and then apply brake brakes and then slow it down so track knowledge is not that important uh, on gnt next slide what happens if you do not comply this is the limit and I already told you there are three steps of control and uh, escalation what happens if you go beyond the limit so this is your actually speed let's say you go beyond the limit at first nothing happens um, the, tr the game will dock you with less points but the train control system will do nothing until you violate the plus three line and then it will start uh, sounding an alarm and this intermittently this is why I have these intermittent uh, yeah dashes here it will sound like de 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 and this is warning you that you are going too fast um, the indicator the SGNT indicator now will stay dark if you don't comply with that and bring down your speed and accelerate further and violate the plus six line the sound will still stay as it was the deed deed at least on the 612 on some trains they are actually have a, a speech that tells you GNT uh, <laughs> not GNT but in German but on our train it will sound this schnarren sound this the deed deed and then the S indicator will start flashing and already the train will apply a penalty brake but on but only with the regular brake system it will not just pop the brake pipe and drain it and bring the train to a stop it will just apply normal brakes e-brakes and maybe uh, normal application in the air brakes and try to slow the train down below the limit if that does not work and the train is still accelerating in violates the plus 10 line 
then we have a different sound now it is not intermittently it is steady it sounds like the schnare is going on continuously also the SGNT button is lighting up steadily and the penalty brake now applies everything that it has it drains the brake pipe and stops the train if necessarily but it on only slows down the train below the limit it doesn't necessarily stop it um, as soon as the speed drops below the limit then the driver can take back control then the brake pipe gets filled again if it was drained and the brake application stops and this is why the speed line can look like this so the speed is brought back under the limit and then the driver can resume control yep like this so that was my presentation for today there was a lot of stuff to tell I feared that I would be digressing or telling a lot of this stuff but there is actually some interesting lore about tilting trains and the technology that controls it we can go on lock the doors prepare to releasing the brakes and then let's try driving this mama home You can see we're approaching a speed changing point. This is why the GGNT button is flashing. So we are in an area where we have those brake curves that are controlling us. You can see here that we are at the moment 120 and we are approaching a speed change to 100. What is obviously not that much of a problem because we had to stop in this section of the track anyway. So we are slow enough. Unlike the access system, I did not mention it, but um, it was obviously in the presentation. We do not have to acknowledge anything. You remember maybe that on the access system you have to acknowledge every reduction in speed limit, even if you are already slow enough. But not so here in the GNT, you don't have to acknowledge anything only thing that you have to do as a driver is to manage speed oh I'm going 80 I am allowed to go 100 not 80 and now I am allowed to go faster even For a short while we are allowed to go 140 and then we have to slow down to 90 but at the same time have to stop at Fleur. So no problem. What I obviously still have to acknowledge in between is the CIFA. The CIFA works just like it always works. Let go of the pedal, press it again. Or press it every now and then now we're running on you can see we get warned by a steady GGNT light that we are approaching a speed limit we can read it in the abula that it will be a speed limit to 90 now the GGNT is flashing we are in the brake curve we bring the speed down and as soon as we hit the speed changing point the GGNT light will come off again but we are approaching the station here is the speed changing point even though we are allowed to ignore the LF6 and LF7 signs they are usually very useful as a marker to see where exactly the speed changing points are Speeds for GNT profile can change between the regular speed changing points, but more often than not, they change at the same spot, so they are useful for that.
I was a 500 point stop, even though I was a bit late on my brakes and had to apply too much brake power at the end. That's why a lot of people are leaving the train and fleeing. So we are in a section where we are reduced to a speed of 90. You can see that the upcoming speed is 100. Next stop will be in Uderan. What is an interesting stop because you are running up a ramp and then just in front of the station the gradient will stop. And this is quite challenging to stop there properly. Still limited to 90. So again, if at the moment we are applying 100% throttle, if you want to reduce it but not let it go down to zero, move it in the opposite direction and then click it back to the direction for acceleration or braking, then you will stop the count down of the brake or acceleration force. Now we should have reached the point where we can accelerate. We can go to 100 now. And we will soon get to a point where we can accelerate even more. Like here. We'll go from 100 to 110 in a second, I guess. Here you can see, and the next one will be even faster. So we can use that to accelerate through Here is the switch to 140, but the problem is that we will have to slow down soon again because in the approach to Uderan we have to slow down to 90 at first and then can go back to 100. So we won't be able to actually accelerate to 140 here. There are two bridges, this bridge and then a s short part between. We can see the warning sign, the LF6 sign, warning us about a reduction to 80 for normal vehicles. For us it is 90 with our tilting technology. Warned. And we are still running uphill. This is what makes this speed reduction here a bit difficult. Because if you brake too much, if you slow down too heavily, then you will not be able to get your train back to speed of 90 and you will lose too much momentum. Here is the switch to 90 and I at least managed to not drop below the 80. And soon we will be allowed to go to 100 again. Here, after passing this sign, back to 100 and now with 100 to Uderan until we have to stop there. Do you like the snow, AJ? 
or is it too glum? Nice to hear. So this DLC, I really like it a lot. It is a great DLC with uh, a very interesting route, with interesting trains, with a lot of speed changes, with a lot of gradient changes, and uh, 612 is a really nicely modeled train. It is fun driving this thing. It took me quite a while to get used to it with this funny control. And it's definitely harder to drive compared to an Electrostar or even the Talon 2. But it's really fun. So, compared to other stations, I'm really late on the brakes here because we are losing a lot of momentum due to the fact that we are still running uphill. And then all of a sudden this part here is not uphill anymore and you have to make sure that you're not running the platform. So this is definitely a stop that takes some practice and I'm not so super great here today because I apply too much brake force to not stall the train here so I actually have to apply some more power to get it into the stop position without losing too much time Or 89. For people who want to get into the 500 stop position here on this DLC, the 500 stop position is rather late, so even if you are on the 2 meter marks, it is possible that you cannot get to 500 points. And here there is a funny thing with the brakes. We will see if that happens again here too. No, not this time. Sometimes you won't be able to accelerate to a higher percentage of 1% starting from this station. I don't know why, especially at this station. If that happens, what helps often is to move the brake lever on the right side here for a short while into A, into 1A and then release the brakes again. So that sometimes the brakes seem to not release properly. But well, this is how you can help the brakes and then you can accelerate normally again. So we are still in the 100 territory. We are still running uphill. We are approaching an increase in track limit. And then we have to be careful because then you can see it on the pause screen here. This is the increase and then shortly after that we will reach the summit. So we have to be prepared to apply some e-brakes to uh, hold the train so that it does not run away on the downhill part. And then there will be a reduction to 110 in the downhill part. But at the moment we can go full throttle to accelerate because we're approaching the increase anyway. So alongside with our snow we also got some fog. What is it doing now? Yeah, that is what I wanted to show you. This is the brake application that we get if we are going beyond the plus uh, six. First we got the sound, the Schnarren sound, and then 
the indicator started flashing because we were going beyond the 100. Driving significantly over speed limit, this is what the game docks is for. But we did not get an immediate brake uh, application here, at least not before the SGNT indicator started flashing. And it did not stop us, but it only slowed us down. It will be different if we violate the plus 10. But now we have to make sure that we do not overspeed because you can see we are running downhill now. Uh, it's 130, 100, not 140. And we will be approaching. So 20% on a normal descent is usually enough to hold the train. We are warned about an incoming reduction to 110. We can try to do this with the combined brake and throttle. Put it to maximum. Now we are beyond the speed again. We heard the sound as an alarm. So this is the control system. Now we are beyond the system. We are back in our regular speed. and everything is cool. But you can see the system is interfering here in a way that it does not apply a full stop penalty brake but just keeps the train within the profile without interfering too much. Now we can accelerate again to 140 here. We are still on the downhill. So don't overdo it. That was the CIFA for a change. So, unlike what I told you in the presentation, what you can read in the directives concerning the GNT, our train did not do an intermittent sound to warn you that you violated the plus three, but a constant sound. Just duly noted. Maybe this is a specific for this train, I'm not entirely sure. But I think it should have been an intermittently sounding alarm. So you can see we are going downhill and now uphill again, still within the 140. After we are on the other side of the valley, after having crossed this bridge here, we have to prepare for accelerating hard again so that we do not lose so much momentum when running uphill. Unfortunately, with this whiteout around us, we cannot see the nicely sculptured scenery that we have on this DLC. But at least we get the whiteout snow. Maybe it clears up again. Next up is in Freiburg. What will be on the descent? After the next summit, you can see it in the profile here, we will get a reduction to 110 before we even reach the summit. And then on the downhill, we will be to 110. And this is where we have to stop at Freiberg. And after Freiberg, the speed reduction gets even more restrictive. Passing a station here.
Incoming speed reduction. Slow down to 110. Release the brakes in time so that you can apply some throttle again. Here's the speed changing point. That was quite nice. We're still running uphill a, a bit and after having crossed the summit well, we will easily see, judging by the way where the needle is leaning at the moment, you can see it is still dropping even if we are, even though we are applying throttle. But now we should be across the summit here. So loose the throttle and apply some holding brake power. Oh, we have not been across the summit, but we soon will be. Have a now we are coasting. Have a close eye on on the speedometer. We are accelerating, so we have to apply some holding brake power so that we do not run the 110 mark. You can easily increase the brake power by just moving the lever into the brake direction and if you want to decrease the brake power just click it into the acceleration direction and then click it into the brake direction when the number has counted down to wherever you want to have it. Now we are getting closer to our stop at Freiberg. So I'm starting to apply brakes of the other kind. I'm getting the power and brake to off, so not to interfere with the automatic brake blending. Oh, we are slow enough already. 60 at 500 is okay. Now we need a bit more. So the end we are at the 40 when we hit the station. I made the platform. Now we can see it appearing out of the fog. Slow down a bit more. Again, I overdid it a bit with the braking, I went a bit too slow. From 10 or 15 kilometers, you can get the train to a stop quite easily with the first notch on your brake. And again, only 498 even though we are at the 2 meters mark because the sweet spot is a bit beyond actually we have a bit of time to have a look around there is a nice yard where you can do some shunting stuff Usually there is a shunter locomotive, yeah, a V60 and a Dosto train. Sometimes you get the G6 instead of the V60. And we go. It stopped snowing, didn't it? Turn off the wipers. The 
Okay, just remember the profile. We are at the 110 reduction. We will get to a 100 and then to a 80. And we will run through the valley and then we can accelerate on the other end of the valley as soon as we are through quite to 100 at first. Alright. And then later to 140 if I can remember correctly. All those things you would usually check on your Ebula system or on the Buchfahrplan. So that you don't need to check it in the pause screen. Hey, hello! Hunterius96. Nice to meet you. Incoming reduction to 100. Possibly a bit. So you can see we get brakes because we were approaching the speed spot, the, the speed changing spot. And now we have to reduce the speed to 80. I have been driving for a while on the new TSW3, but it lags. Do you know if there is some kind of a FPS boost mod somewhere? Well, uh, no, I'm afraid I don't know if there is a mod. Th I've heard of mods that just reduce the performance in favor of FPS. But I can't tell you which of them is really working for your setup. I, for my part, I just accept the FPS as I get it. And obviously it is always quite helpful to switch off the dynamic weather if you have FPS issues. A lot of FPS issues can be can be made better than Sometimes it actually helps installing fewer DLCs, but the dynamic weather I think does a lot. So I would just try that. Maybe it helps at least a bit. So back to our profile, we are still reduced, uh, r we are still limited to the 80. And after this station here, we should be able to accelerate to 100 again. Started snowing again. So I think this is the spot where we can go back to the 100. Yes. At least our reduced abular is telling us that. It takes some practice to to really balance the speed properly here, so it is not really easy, at least not for me, to stay close to the limits and not violating them. Because the train is comparatively slow in adjusting the speed.
Next stop is at Klingenberg Kolmitz, where is the station on the top end of the Taranta Rampe that was namesake for this DLC. And from there on we will be running down this Rampe and then drive to Dresden from Tarant. We're still in the 100, right? Not the 140. I forget, forgot what the speed changing point looked like where we can switch to the 140. But it can't be so far away. Ah, yeah. It was shortly before Nida Borbic or whatever this station its name is. I think it is here. Let's just check on our... Yes, we can go to 140. And this is Nida Borbic. What is it actually called? Nida Bobric. Alright. So... This station building is always lit up like a Christmas tree, even during day, for whatever reason. A Dosto train from the opposite direction. Nicely modeled spray. So, before we get to Klingenberg Kormitz, we will be getting a reduction to, what is it, 100, I guess? And this is one that is really sensitive. Even though you're running uphill, you have to reduce your speed seriously, so that you do not get a penalty break, and a serious penalty break, with draining your, your brake pipe. The nice thing about this train, even if it applies a penalty brake and drains your brake pipe because of the GNT, it fills the brake pipe uh, automatically again after the train is below the speed limit again. You can see this on the yellow hand on the right dial can see the brake pipe being drained and then refilled automatically. You don't need to do that by hand like on an ICE-1. So, reduction in speed limit announced. G and T indicator flashing and we are slowing down to the 100 and already to the stop at Klingenberg Kolmitz so no penalty break for us this time as long as the G G and T thing is flashing you know we have not passed the speed changing point now this is the speed changing point and Due to my explanations, I actually almost forgot to stop. But again, this train is actually quite forgiving when it comes to late braking, because it slows down really nicely, even in the medium brake power range. This time a bit beyond the speed sp sweet spot. Passengers with this train actually have quite some hopping to do when they get out of the train. 
and on the train because there are those stairs you can see that right so this is not really something that is good for um, accessibility regulations and it is difficult for the passenger animations because no that not no one is actually hopping off the train anymore but they are really jumping down those steps closed brake release I hope the train doesn't start running away. Alright, and now we do the downhill run of the Tarantar Rampe, what is a fun thing to do because it is a really heavy gradient, it's about 2.4% um, gradient downhill, what is a lot for a train that is about like almost jumping out of a window. So accelerating to the 100, prepared for a distance with a reduction to 90, then we can accelerate to 100 again, then there will be a section with a reduction to 80, then 100 again, and then Tarant, as far as I remember. So, 100. Holding break and preparing for the 90 GGNT indicator has not started lighting up again, but it will soon do that, I'm sure. Here we are. Now we have to bring down the speed below the 90, and then we need about 50% or even a bit more to keep the speed steady this is something i always have to get some experience in with balancing it out and what setting for your holding brake the train will actually stay at a steady speed and at what setting it will accelerate at what setting it will decelerate If you need to lose speed quickly, then you can always use the proper brake, like I was a bit late here because of the externals. So to hold the train in place, we really need about 50% uh, here. Obviously there are some sections where the gradient is less harsh and you need to be able to make sure that you don't stall the train now we are back to 100 that is allowed we can actually accelerate here a bit but careful because at the end of the stretch here what is a bit of an even part or a level part just on my monitor yeah we are too fast I know that because I saw that my stream seemed to have frozen at least from what I can see HAR am I still there for you or did I lose you The stream is fine, okay, then it is just on my PC. Well, you saw we were approaching 
a limit to 80. I hope I'm not too late now. I'm trying to do this with the holding brake alone. And this should be good. Getting distracted in this descent is always difficult. Should not happen in real life. Here's the reduction to 80. Oh. Then we will be going to the tunnel. The Edle Krone tunnel. And then the Edle Krone station afterwards. What is a weird name even in German? Means a venerable crown. Don't know why this spot is called a venerable crown. This is the station. The station is a bit level. Don't need that much holding brake. Oop, where did this guy come from? But now the grading in is getting steep again, so we need more holding brake. And now we are in the nice valley. And approaching Tarant, what is at the bottom of the Tarant Rampe. So, starting at this sign, we can accelerate to 100 again for a spell. And then we will get some signals, most probably, slowing us down to 60 for the stop at Tatarant, where we are going into a siding. And again, as a reminder, the signal speed from signals we have to comply with unlike the signal speed from the LF6 and LF7 signs that we can ignore while running on the GNT. So here is a signal that tells us we have to slow down to 60 soon. 1000 Hertz PZBO, I have to slow down to 80, what I'm doing with the holding brake. I can ignore this sign, even though it has a magnet, because it is an LF6 sign, and it does not comply to our speed profile, but not so the signal speed reduction on the light signal. Now the reduction is already signaled by the GNT lamp. Those are repeaters. According to operating rules, I acknowledge the repeaters too, even though they typically do not have a magnet attached to them. And now the reduction to 60. There is a light engine coming from the opposite direction at 146, if I saw that correctly, or maybe at 185.2. More like, probably. Now we are going into the Tarant station. Now we are on level ground, we made it down the Taranta Rampe. And I don't know about you, I really enjoy running down the Taranta Rampe. This is great fun. This repeater will get acknowledged too, because another 
signal reduction to 60 for getting out of the station again. We have the time to slow down really sweet. For a 100, uh, for a 500 point stop, yeah, and this is Tarant Station. This is the little town, village, whatever. That is the namesake for the whole DLC here. No time to lose. And now the last spell, the last leg, back to Dresden, Hauptbahnhof. Even though the track speed is back to a higher value, we have to adhere to the signal 60. Until we are out of the siding. Another light? No, this is not a light engine, this is a... <laughs> it was a bus. <laughs> I thought how many light engines are running in this DLC here, but it was a bus on <laughs> the road. So, now we can accelerate to 140 on this bit of track here. Mustn't forget that we have to stop at Freital, Freital Doiben. What is at the end of a reduction to 110 that is incoming. And this is a stop that I, for what reason ever, tend to forget a lot. Because I'm always so happy that I can accelerate after the reduction to 110 that I forget to stop. Reduction to 110 is already signaled. We will not be able to get to a higher speed. A lot. So we just let it coast a bit and then bring it down. I think it is in the middle of this platform here, the speed changing point. Yeah, here it is at the end to be exact. And now we have to stay. That is actually a thing for coasting. Now we got out of the fog, now that we are off the ramp. And actually get some sunshine on our snow. This is the station where they modeled those old passenger cars that are standing around on the sidings that you cannot use, unfortunately. I don't think that they are really rolling stock. They are most probably just scenery elements. And because I had my train coasting, we will be a bit late at Freital Doiben. not too late on the brakes now. Nah, that's okay. Again, you can see how forgiving the strain is when you're late on the brakes. There is a certain spot where this train switches down and all of a sudden loses 
momentum when you drop below the 20 and then you lose speed quite fast at 15 if you run then at 25 meters should usually get you to a stop at the correct position maybe on the snowy tracks a bit more early because you tend to slide a bit further Freital Däuben here and we are very much on the timetable applying the blind here but this is the wipers here, the blind actually works automatically you don't have to shift it around by hand <laughs> it is done with motors but now it is in the way so we have to put it back up Whoop. So, next stop is already Dresden Hauptbahnhof. Starting from Freital Däuben, we can accelerate right away to the 140. But then we will have to slow down already soon to 120, then 80, then 70, and then the GNT ends. Actually, there are some steps in between, right? What is the next 110? 130, then 110. We're already prepared for the 110. There's no point in accelerating hard. We will get the warning anyway. Passing this station here. is the next reduction to 110 and from that we can run with 110 a bit until the next reduction to 80 another 612 Need some holding brakes here, I guess. Next station, I think. Ah, uh, here's the advance warning for the reduction to 80. What happens after this bridge in the bend to the left with the facility on the right side when we are running elevated this is what I used to remember the waypoints and landmarks for speed reductions so slowing down to 80 is what we have to do will we make it with the holding brake alone probably not quite maybe we'll do that here it is, coming in. Yeah, we will be able to do that. This is the facility to the right that I talked about. Now there is this station, I forgot the name, with those timber construction and this always gives you a bad lag. I don't know why it is so hard lagging here. 
don't know if it is the same for you, you just heard it in the sound and now just wait for us passing this spot here. Like now. I wonder where this lag is coming from. Maybe because it has to load all the rest at this point. Here is a flashing yellow HL signal warning us to a reduction to 60 or 40. We know it will be a reduction to 40, even before we get to the reduction to 70. Well, what, is, what is incoming now? There is a 155 on the siding and the Dosto train. And now the GNT stopped. You can see that the U indicator, the umlaut indicator, went dark. We are back to normal train control. Normal PZB. You can see that we are in a 1000 Hz because of the flashing yellow HL signal. And we have to bring down our speed to 40 at the next signal around the bend. There will be the next signal and we have to go down to 40 there or until then. There are the signals. The yellow one is for us. It is a flashing yellow above a steady yellow. That means 40 now, slow again later in HL language. Now we can just let the coast, uh, the train coast with the one with the 40 until we get to the next signal. Those W signals for the shunting they always give me a shock because they look like a red signal from afar. Here is the funny situation where we have a KS repeater telling us an incoming reduction to 40 after we got an HL signal announcing a reduction to 40 and then we have actually the KS signal telling us 40 now stop later and we are running into a dead end track this is what this tilted T on the bottom tells us obviously we had to acknowledge it for the stop later we are running through this ditch where we have to apply some brake force until we are at the bottom and then some power to pull us out of the ditch again and then we can coast with 40 into the rest and main station what is up ahead Usually we get a strange visual effect when we're running in here. To die obviously. Ah, it happens a bit. There are no elephants here at Dresden Hauptbahnhof because we are in the Tarant Rampe DLC and not in the Dresden Nahverkehr DLC. Even though it is the same station it is set in different times and the elephants that are loose in the Dresden Nahverkehr DLC are obviously not born or most probably not even born no, at the time that we are at at the moment or maybe they are can't see how old the elephants are that are loose in the Dresden Nahverkehr DLC perfect stop for the conclusion of this stream we can see our passengers hopping off the train boop, 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 because they have to navigate those steep steps um, yeah 
It was a bit a complicated stream because we had to talk about a lot of stuff like the Nike technique, the tilting technology and then the GNT what is the train control system that is only designed for those tilting trains and the Deutsche Bahn considers those tilting trains a dying technology so probably the GNT technology is a dying technology too. Um, nevertheless I am quite happy that it was uh, modeled in the game and it is modeled really well. What does not work is that um, if you turn off the tilting technology then usually the GNT should control you to the normal speed profile what it doesn't. And um, This uh, actually leads us to the interesting thought that uh, the GNT system with those balises could totally control the normal speed profiles for non-tilting train as well just like the access system does it on the northeast corridor corridor but um, this is not the way that the Deutsche Bahn is going obviously so thank you very much for uh, watching and for bearing with me thank you AJ if you are still awake for moderating the stream and uh, see you soon take care